black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. And I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me, and this look of I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was he was he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. How's everyone doing, by the way? Sunday night. Uh, gosh, this week went by fast. I don't know where, where you guys are at listening to the show, uh, but I can tell you here in the Pacific Northwest, it almost feels like summertime's here already. I think it's supposed to be 90 today, um, and so it's pretty hot. That's hot for here. Uh, but thank you so much for listening tonight. Uh, I'll be welcoming Connie to the show, and I'll probably end up doing a two-part, maybe a three-part show with Connie uh, because – there's so much that has gone on on this property, and she has hours and hours and hours and hours of recordings. She has some very interesting pictures. She has some very uh, just odd things that happen around the property. And it's one of those situations to where, and I hear this time and time again from people, they buy a piece of property, strange things start happening. They kind of brush it off. Well, it's probably this or it's probably that. And then things get weirder and weirder and weirder. You know, people's names being called, uh, dogs' names being called from the forest. Very odd, strange things uh, that were going on and around this property. And one of the things, I'll play it again in the show, but I'll play it for you here in a moment. One of the things that uh, Connie talked about was hearing this baby crying. And this is, uh, you know, middle of winter, 12 o'clock at night, um, right on the edge of the tree line. Actually, here, I'll just play it for you. Here's what she captured. Strange. And I asked Connie to send me short clips of audio, and I'll play some of that tonight, of things that happened on the property. Um, and, And she did. She sent me some clips. And so when I have Connie back on the show, we'll get some longer clips and some more pictures, and I'll post those too as well. Um, actually, take a listen to this one. This one is a um, something hitting the side of the cabin in the middle of the night. Just a lot of strange noises, you know, that uh, she was able to capture. And and it's fascinating, too. I'll bring Connie on here in a moment. But it's fascinating because Connie was trying to find um, who was actually messing with the cabin. They thought it was homeless people messing with the cabin. Uh, So tonight, we'll just go over the tip of the iceberg, kind of give a background of the property. And then I'll probably have Connie back um, on the show. Like I said, it would end up being like a probably a four-hour show with all the things that happened and all the audio and some of the pictures. But if you get a chance, go to SasquatchChronicles.com. I'll post a couple of the pictures, and and you guys can check out uh, some of the things that we talk about tonight. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is Wes at SasquatchChronicles.com. Uh, if you get a chance, visit SasquatchChronicles.com. You can become a member, get additional shows. Um, I'll most likely be back on Tuesday Uh, for you guys. I got a show I'm working on, so I may be back on Tuesday. Don't hold me to it, but I'll most likely be back on Tuesday. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Connie to the show. Connie, thanks for coming on. Thank you. 
Yeah, I appreciate you being here. Thanks. Um, yes, and thank you for creating a platform for people to speak. And thanks for listening. It's been a big help. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I appreciate you coming forward. I know there's been so much that has happened on this property. And I want to play some sounds tonight uh, that you've recorded. Uh, but before we get into all of that, for the audience, would you kind of start from the very beginning and tell us about this property and how did everything kind of start and maybe kind of walk into when you started to realize something was going on here? Okay. Um, actually, this is still unfolding in real time and it's been stressful and sad and frightening all the same time. And I'll try and make sense to give you an idea of how profound this is to me. It took about four weeks of collecting evidence to convince me that this is something I do not understand. I will never understand. And I want no part of it that my life there is changed forever and not in a good way. Um, that we were going to give up and move from a place that we worked hard to get and we really loved in the beginning. So I guess the best place to start is in the beginning. In 2007, we bought five acres, built a vacation cabin overlooking the Illinois River in Northeast Oklahoma very pretty up there. As soon as the doors and windows were in, we started camping out in the house on the weekends. And there were a few odd occurrences. There were some wood knocks that can be dismissed. Newly installed drain pipe under the house was found broken, no apparent reason. A door and the door frame were pushed in and broken and had to be replaced. We found circular saw blades from the construction site below the house on a steep slope. My bird feeder would disappear, and I would find it in the tree line or in deep grass at the edge of the property, and I'd just stop using it. I was tired of hunting it down. And I always wondered how and why a raccoon would carry a bird feeder across a steep slope through the grass and brush. And that's all I thought it was. The rest we just miss as kids, vandalizing the property or somebody trying to break in. So we retired and moved there full time in 2012. And we actually bought the five acres next door and built a guest house. We continued to hear wood knocking occasionally. And as I said, that can be dismissed. When family came to visit, we liked to sit outside after dark around a fire. And on one occasion, they'd been roasting marshmallows when my daughter just stopped and said, there was a wood knock across the street. And my husband always laughs it off and says, it's either a deer or it's a squirrel. Shortly after that, something behind us in the tree line made a long moan yell vocal that ended in an owl type sound. My son-in-law got up went inside, and he was a deputy sheriff. My daughter thought I made the sound because it sounded like a human voice at first, and I assured her I wasn't capable of doing that. My husband was sure it was an owl, but we all decided to call it a night and go inside anyway. So the odd occurrences started becoming, like, strange and not so easy to dismiss. My husband would take our dogs out before dawn or it was even light. And every few weeks, he would tell me that there was an owl mocking our French bulldog barking. And she would bark and it would bark back. And I was actually able to capture the, what I call a fake bark at a later date after I started a quote unquote listening project, which I will get into later. What was harder to figure out was why someone would be across the street trespassing in the middle of the day and mock me calling my dog Buster. I would yell Buster and someone mocked me almost exactly. I looked over there and saw nothing, but it was summer in the forest and none of the brush was thick. So I convinced myself someone was over there playing a trick on me. 
So it started making me feel uneasy, actually scared to go into the forest over there. And a late night call from a neighbor living at the north side of the acreage didn't help that much either. My husband got a call at about 10.30 one night asking if he heard that. And he was pretty sure that neighbor had been drinking. His name is Hack. He likes to call himself Hack. And he told my husband, you can smell them before you see them. And my husband just wanted to go back to bed. So he assured him he heard nothing. So I think now I know what he was trying to tell us. The acreage, the 29 acres, had been been for sale for like eight years. No takers. We had a chance to get a good deal on it. And we didn't want neighbors because at this time we had no neighbors close and we could see nobody. We were surrounded by the acreage. So we went ahead and bought the land in 2016. And over the next year, I tried to stop being afraid of the acreage by spending some time over there, taking pictures of the landscape, had no problems. So in May of last year, We decided to bulldoze down some trees so we could see the river because it had a river view and move a cabin in. We had water and electricity installed and the cabin arrived early June. Now there was noise coming from the acreage and there was no denying it. You could hear it in real time. I stood in the driveway and across the street from the acreage and watched my husband drive the tractor to the edge of the 29 acres, he was, I think, taking some brush back there. I clearly heard Knox marking his movement through the woods. I was frantically trying to get him to answer his phone, and he couldn't hear it. As he approached the clear cut and the edge of the property, I could hear the tractor, but I could also hear a third knock over there. And I was relieved to see him come up the slope in one piece, because I had never heard that many knocks during the day in a row. It was completely different. Something had changed. He couldn't hear the phone, and he couldn't hear the knocks over the tractor. So now I was officially terrified of what was over there, and I asked him to carry a gun, and he only did it for a short time. The dogs were on alert. They were barking more. One evening they'd been barking a lot, So I went outside and I listened. I could hear loud metallic banging. It was further back towards the back part where he had some deer stands laying on the ground. So I felt somebody was trying to steal the deer stands or possibly vandalizing or breaking into the cabin. So my husband went over there, looked around, saw nothing. Um, The activity then moved across the street to the guest house where my daughter was staying. Yeah, and, and I want to started with, and I want to get into that. I apologize, I didn't mean to cut you off. I wanted to ask you though, because oh, sure. you know we get we'll get to the point to where you realize actually what's going on um, out at this uh-huh. property, and I, I was really fascinated by it. Um, I wanted to ask you though, prior to this, what what did you think was going on? I mean, what obviously you knew something was was off, but I mean, what what did you think was actually going on? Um, really nothing because <clears throat> it could be easily dismissed. I mean, the wood knocks that we heard were very infrequent. And I would say maybe one knock per year. The dogs would alert over there, but that, there was a lot of wildlife. There was a lot of deer. There was turkey. So that was easily dismissed. Um, the, when we were sitting outside around the fire pit, when that moan yell started, it was very close and and surprisingly, nobody jumped up, nobody got terrified, nobody got still, we just sat there and it was dark. So I guess somebody, the first thing my daughter says, I thought you were making that sound. I said, no, I'm not making that sound. But when it ended in an owl type sound, I could mentally say, okay, that must be a type of owl that does that. And I didn't know what type it would be, but because it sounded owl-like at the end, I was good with it. I gotcha. 
And, and, I, I, think, would, and I think that's a normal reaction, Connie. I mean, cut you off again. I apologize. I think that's a normal reaction of people in that situation. You want to pass it off as, well, it must be this or it must be that. And that's why I love your encounter so much is because it starts to get to the point to where you can't really brush things off. You can't really say, well, at some point you got to look this thing in the face. You can't, so, so to speak, uh, you can't um, mm-hmm. quickly just dismiss things, especially when it ramps up. You know what I mean? Mm-mm. And yeah, that's kind of how it started. So, and we kind of had it. In, I had heard of a long time ago when it actually happened, the um, Patterson Gimlin film. I thought, yeah, that's interesting. And there was some other, I think it was a Boss Bird tracks or something. I saw that on the news, but it never really, I was really never interested in it. I thought that was, okay, I had no interest in it at all. And the first. I was going to get into this later, but I'll tell you now. Um, My husband had had, he hunted and fished a lot. And he's been up to Canada, Michigan, Indiana, all over. And the only places at any experience was Oklahoma and Arkansas. And the first inkling I got that there just might be something is he went on a gigging trip with friends. He did that every spring. It was around Jay, Oklahoma. And they all went and slept in this great big tent together. There's three or four men there. And they had been gigging all day. And they came back. They cooked their fish. Then they all retired into this one big tent. I guess something shortly after that started circling their camp and screaming. And he said everybody just kind of looked at each other and shrugged. But nobody wanted to get up and go out and see what it was. They just laid there. I said, why didn't you go see what it was? He said, because we didn't want it to know we were in there. So they had, they listened to it circle and scream. And then I guess they eventually fell asleep. It eventually left. And they asked a game warden what could make that sound. And he said, well, there's elk in the area. So maybe it was elk. So they, I guess the next time they went, they went armed and then they only went a couple of times after that. And they had had a couple of more experience and one was in Stephenthal, which is down Louisiana, Arkansas border. He went there by himself. He took a boat eight miles up a river, I guess, and decided he was going to camp by himself. He set up his camp and he, trained his boat and padlocked it. And I don't know why, but he said that he had just fallen asleep and he heard clump like a big rock hitting the water. And he thought, okay, maybe it was a fish, but there were several of them, but it was, he said, after that, there was monkey type gibberish chat chattering, like in the zoo, they get real excited he said it was sounded like a bunch of monkeys getting super excited. At that point, he wanted out of there, but he knew he had to go out in the dark. He had to undo the padlock and get the chain off, and he was actually too afraid to leave the tent. So he said he actually slept with the gun across his chest, and then if he saw anything block out the light above him, he was just going to start shooting. So that's a place he never went back to. And the only time I think he really confessed that he was afraid. So I was kind of thinking, well, there may be something out there, but it could never be on my property. I mean, this is what I call suburbia. I mean, there's people around that property and there's a town within 11 miles of that property. Yeah. So, I don't think anyone ever wants know, it on their property, you know what I mean? No. Yeah. It's like if they can be that close. And I had talked to somebody and they said, honestly, they have probably been there the whole time and you just didn't key in on it. I would agree with and that. And they are, are around watching you 
all the time. Yeah. And you just didn't know it. Well, so, and you decided to build this home. And, that, and going back to your husband's encounter, that's terrifying. And it's amazing to me uh-huh. because I hear so many of these from hunters. I mean, you have no idea. Um, and it always amazes me because hunters, you would think, would come out and just start blasting, but they don't. They're the last people to come out and start blasting. Generally, they have this weird reaction. I don't know what it is with hunters, but they have this weird reaction of, I'll just close my eyes and it'll go away and then I'll never discuss it again. I'm not saying that's what your husband did, but you know, most hunters, that's kind of their mentality on it. Um, but going back to- I'll have to tell you the just the third one was actually at the end of the road, there's a primitive boat ramp and he liked to hunt down there. So this was just like two miles down. And this was just like a year or two ago. He'd go up pre-dawn and sit there and wait for daylight and hunt. He said something was next to him and he said it sounded like a Louisville slugger hitting the tree and he didn't move a muscle. He sat there and just waited for daylight because he couldn't see anything. So I don't know if it's because he didn't get up and run and he doesn't react and he he does pretend that nothing's going to happen to me. This is nothing. He's getting away with it at this point. So I don't know what it's going to take. Yeah, I hear you. I, I hear you. being charged, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope not. Let's hope not. I wanted to ask you, so you go and you decide you're going to build a home on the property. You guys have cleared out some trees and now you're, you guys are – was a home existing or did you guys build it? I know for your daughter. No, we – he, we actually, he had hunted up there for many years and he decided he wanted to have like a vacation home. And the very, the acreage was all owned by the same man. And the first five acres, nobody could tell that it had a river view. It was completely overgrown. And we had waded through there and saw that it had a really beautiful river view and a, we call it a mountain view, small hill. So we bought that and yeah, we had that built. And then when that one was completed and we had lived up there full time for a while, the people, there were, there was a doctor and um, two doctors that bought the acreage next to us and they approached us and said, do you want to buy this? Because we, we don't want it anymore. So we bought that from them. And then we had kids come up and friends come up and we decided, well, it'd be nice to have a guest house. So we, built a little guest house and just between those two houses, there wasn't that many issues. There were things that you could dismiss. It was not until we did a lot of clearing on that 29 acres that everything started happening. The major stuff, they made themselves known in a big way. And I started to have to pay attention because it was getting real at that point. Well, if you would walk us and into it, it. Tell, tell us how 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 did things change? What started happening? Um, I know your daughter moved into that that home. If you would just kind of walk us into where it goes from, I can dismiss this to there's something going on here. I think we actually he had we got the acreage in 2016. We spent a year. He spent quite a bit of time over there just picking up and clearing because it was pretty overgrown. It had never been developed. Nobody had ever been over there. And we had spent just ourselves over there cutting down trees, clearing brush the whole spring that year. And then we decided just to go for it. And we hired a bulldozer. He came in and did a lot more clearing. Then we hired a tree crew and they actually scaled down the slope and felled some really, really big trees. So we took down probably maybe 40 trees. It was a lot of trees to get the river view. And then I had it cleared another time because I was afraid some of these bigger trees, since a lot of them do fall, would hit that cabin. So we just even widened the area more. Still had no inkling nothing was happening at that point. Utilities are all in. House is delivered June. Get that all set up and skirted, no problem. I started going over there by myself, and there's new sod. 
And the first time I felt, what in the heck is this? I had my back to the forest. And as a perfectly calm, beautiful June day, no wind. And I did not see what came down. I saw the end result. I heard the noise. A full-size, very large tree was just swaying back and forth. It was a very large, large crack. So my husband was kind of off in the distance. And I said, did you hear that? Did you see that? He says, why don't you go over there and see what did it? I kind of creeped over there, but there was so much debris that I couldn't see anything. It was just a lot of growth. You couldn't see through it. I don't know. It just, it didn't seem right. It seemed odd. And and I've never seen such a large tree, the whole thing from the top all the way to the bottom, as far as I could see, just moving like a foot side to side. So I tried not to stay out there after dark too much. I was really trying hard not to be afraid. And at that point, I wasn't really, I started hearing noises, more noises. Like I described, he, after that was delivered the first time ever in daylight, while I was watching him drive away, I was hearing knocks that were following his movement, very distinct, very loud, three of them. And I knew that was not people over there. There would be no reason for that. And then uh, the activity started picking up across the street. And that's when she started saying, I, there is a, something that I can only describe as a ground thud. She said it actually was very loud to her. I did not hear it. And she said it actually vibrated vibrated through the floor and she felt it through the sofa she was sitting on. So we looked around, found nothing. And then for some reason, she's closer to the area, I don't know, but she could hear more metallic banging than we could there were farm implements over there, like a rock rake and a brush hog. And there was like three or four deer stands over there. Some were up, some were on the ground. There yeah. And, and, for, and for the audience listening, you're, you're talking about, so your daughter moved into the guest home and she's now starting to hear, when you say she, that's who you're referring to for the audience. Uh, you're referring to your Correct. daughter. Yeah. Yes. And so she was hearing like vibrating, like something was jumping down and landing on I, the ground. Mm-hmm. She didn't understand. But she was trying to describe to me that she said there was so, a very loud noise and I actually felt it through the ground, through the sofa. It vibrated the sofa. And I thought, mm, okay, maybe because there was a lot of earthquakes in Oklahoma possibility. So, you know, we kind of looked around, but then she would say, well, there's really loud metallic banging outside and it's in the middle of the night. Um, The other thing, she would walk to our house, which one property, each house is sitting on five acres. So she would walk from where she was staying over to our house in the morning and she was blind in one eye and she uses a walking stick. And she said, without fail, Every morning when I come out, something, I hear something quite loud, like walking in the wood line. I can't see it, but it stops right when I get to the edge of your fence. And I said, every day? And she says, every day. So we have no idea what that is, what it represents. Couldn't see anything. It kept going. It started getting to the point where it was such as one night she was sitting in bed in the master bedroom. She had her head up against the wall, the outside wall. She was watching a movie on her phone. She felt like something was hitting the wall directly opposite of where her head was resting on the wall. She said it actually caused my head to bounce a little bit. So she paused the movie and listened and thinking maybe, okay, was there an earthquake? That every time she started the movie again, it would hit the wall in the same spot. So she 
called me and I spotlighted over there. I drove up and down the road. I truly expected kids or a homeless person or a vagrant or I did not have any idea, but searched around the house and nothing. So we added more security lights. And at that time we decided, okay, we need to find out what this is. We need to put up maybe game cameras and stick some recorders out and see if we can capture something, anything, find out what is making noise across the street and maybe capture somebody come up to the guest house at night. And I just wanted to just stop and I wanted to catch who was doing it. So we bought two Olympus recorders for game cameras and got a parabolic dish. And we were really naive and didn't know what we were doing. So we started out by going to the really far edge of the property where I heard the knock and attached the recorder to a tree with a bungee cord. And we put game cameras in random spots, just trying different settings. And the first recording we got was something walking around the recorder for about, I'd say, 20 minutes, touching the recorder, then it seemed to leave, and then it seemed to come back, and then it finally grabbed it, and it pulled it hard. And if you can imagine what a bungee cord sounds like being pulled, it just pulled it and kept pulling it. Because it was on stretchy cord, it kept making attempts to pull it off the tree. I thought, well, why didn't it just jerk it off? But the next day, we found the recorder. As we left it, it was intact. There was no damage. There was no teeth marks. Couldn't explain it. But it happened again. So I decided to start hiding the recorder, or at least putting it behind a screen inside a window. So at that point, the game cameras were capturing deer, raccoons, boxes, bugs, And then there were some unexplainable images as if something is too close to the camera and it blurs or whites it out in parts, plus lots of orbs, round orbs, not bugs, orbs. Yeah. And and I definitely, I definitely want to get to the, the orbs. I don't mean to cut you off, but, and and I'll post some of the pictures Mm -hmm. you sent me. Um, There's one in particular and I, and I don't have it up at the moment, but I, I had it up before we um, started, started before I brought you on air. And I was looking at one. You had mentioned, mm-hmm. hey, there's something running across the bottom of the, the game cam. Did you see the eye shine that was like 10 feet yes. up that was standing there watching the, the game cam? Yes. And I, since it's, I was doing time lapse, so there was a picture every 10 seconds. And somebody else that saw that mentioned that. They said, are you sure that's not just city lights back that way? Or is that light on the ridge? So I tried to match it up, match the trees up the best I could. And I found out that that game camera had been shifted. I don't know how many inches, but I had the pictures wouldn't match up anymore about the time that you see that thing at the lower right-hand side. So I wasn't real, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on it, and I wasn't real definitive. I don't know if that is lights on the ridge, and that was the camera is within the process of being moved, and that's why it looks like those lights have stems on them. I would have to go back there and really pull the pictures out and study it closely. Yeah, I don't, I don't think See, that's lights on a it ridge. Just seems, it seems odd to be lights on a ridge because of just the, um, how they are, how bright they are. And the ridge is pretty far behind. It, it's hard for you to tell in the dark, but the, the following ridge is pretty far behind where that, those, that light is. Yeah. It looked so like two that eyes. Is, that's a mystery. Yeah. I mean, it looked like two eyes to me. Um, and I've seen eye shine from these things before, and it, it, their eyes, you'll you will know when you see their eyes. And for the audience, if they want to go to SasquatchChronicles.com, I'll post those pictures. But um, I think there's something standing right there looking at the camera, kind of off in the distance. And it, it's pretty high up. 
I know you said, hey, look at the thing down at the bottom right-hand corner, but immediately when I zoomed in, I was like, holy crap, man, there's something standing right there looking right at the camera. I mean, that, yeah, that area actually, um, I can't remember. I think it kind of goes down. So I don't really know the terrain. It's really uneven, rocky terrain. That area is like a thousand feet above the river. But what I also noticed, and this could be absolutely totally pareidolia, but I swear there there's black shapes at the edge of the light sitting in the grass or something that's suggestive of that. So I didn't rule out that there was some type of bigger type creatures or something sitting around the perimeter of that area. Yeah, it's it's so, it's fascinating. So I want to go back to your daughter and then we'll get into I'll play some sounds here in a moment, but um, your daughter actually caught something on the deck coming up. Uh, was it banging on the house or what was it doing that she saw? I don't, I don't recall why she told me she was up at, Oh, she said she like, she can't sleep well at night. So she's up really, really late half the night basically. And she, we were feeding the deer at the time. We would throw corn out on the ground right outside the door and the deer would actually come really close to the house and she enjoyed watching them in the middle of the night. And she had gotten up to see if the deer were out there. And she said right at the edge of the porch, there was something black. She was about the size of our Boston Terrier, which she's like 20 some pounds and it had no tail. I said, she said it was sniffing the ground and it kind of waddled off in, on four legs off into the forest. She did not see the face of it or it never stood up. I actually, I was having a hard time figuring out where to put cameras. I was actually putting them very, very close on the porch to try and capture what I thought would be somebody trying to break in. I don't know. And I decided to move them further away, like way across the yard. And I had one quite a distance away, but it was still able to capture pictures because the outside of the house was lit up. And I can tell because I know what's on the porch. There is a um, picnic table. But that picture has about four of those size things on and around that table. And I can see it looks like a very large type creature sitting on the riverside at the edge of the porch, like staring into the window. Because at that time, we never put any curtains on any of the houses on the river view side because we wanted to see the river. That's one I would have a hard time convincing people, but I know what's there and it didn't include like five or four or five of those little black things, whatever they are sitting there. So that was always a mystery to me. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, and I'll I'll play some sounds here in a moment. I know I keep saying that, but I wanted to ask you, at what point did you realize, okay, we got a problem here? I mean, we'll talk about the orbs in a moment, but I mean, as far as what you guys are experiencing and the noises that you're hearing, some of the stuff you're capturing on camera, some of the audio that you're, you're getting, at what point did you stop and go, we got a real problem here? It was probably a culmination of a lot of things. Um, I know that my son-in-law was up there and they liked to like stargaze. They had a telescope and they would go out actually in the front yard, which is directly across the street from that acreage. And it was dark out there. So you could see the stars and we had gone inside and he was out there by himself and he came in and he just kind of under his breath came by me and said, I wish I knew what that was that charged through the forest away from me. And I said, did it snort like a deer? He said, nope. So he acted kind of unnerved about it, but I had, Two other people that mentioned that to me, we had my sister-in-law come stay in that new cabin and we did not tell her anything on purpose because we didn't have some of the evidence that we have now. 
And I don't think she would have minded anyway because she lived in Wisconsin. She had black bears come off her porch, so she's pretty tough. She came back and she she's at my house and she said, I was walking back there to take a nap in the afternoon and something pretty large took off and started running through the woods. And my husband piped up and said, well, I, it might be that group of turkeys. And she said, I know what it takes to make a sound. And it was more than turkeys. It was something pretty large. And eventually we kind of fessed up to her and, um, she didn't get mad at us, <laughs> but she said, hmm, that kind of makes sense because it was sounded large. And we had some total strangers actually stop by because they had seen this little cabin from the road. And my husband brought them back there because they wanted to see the river view. So they were all standing there admiring the river view. And this was during the day. And he noticed that the wife was kind of looking off to the right and finally, the husband said, what, what's wrong with you? Why are you looking at her? And she says, because something's moving in there. It startled her, and it didn't sound normal to her. And my husband just said, it might be that Sasquatch, and just laughed. <laughs> so that was that, and they left. They actually asked if they could rent it on weekends, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I heard. Three people that kind of have noticed that there is something quite large that sometimes moves around in there. It was probably a culmination of a lot of things. Probably what scared me the most was hearing how the knocking was following him traveling. And I had never heard it during the day while I was standing out there. I also heard the metallic banging. And probably the other thing was I started using that parabolic dish. And I would sit in the front bedroom, which was right across the street, turn all the lights out and listen from like 11 o'clock. And sometimes it was really bad, so bad that I thought they were literally tearing the place apart. And I thought, okay, I have called the sheriff on one occasion and they found nothing. So how am I going to explain this? But I hear noises over there. Please come check it out. So I just put the dish down and went to bed. It's like there was lots of like limb snapping, lots of brush movement, a lot of it. There was banging on the metal. You can tell it's probably the metal farm implements or something metallic back there. I didn't hear a lot of the vocals that I captured on the recorder, but it was a lot of noise. It's like you, something grabs a great big branch and it's got leaves on it and they're swishing it up and down real fast and then putting it aside. And then they'll pick up another one and then swish it and put it aside or they turn over a log. It was just that type of noise banging and I know you're, you've recorded. So, I know you've recorded so much um, audio. I mean, we could do like an eight-hour show with some of the audio you captured. Um, and I want to get into mm-hmm. some of this other stuff, but let's jump to a piece of audio. Uh, this one's called "Juvenile Crying" um, at 12 a.m. at the garage window. And you know what? You know what's fascinating about that piece of audio. Um, I actually sent it to a guy who was out um, hunting one time, and he kept hearing this baby crying. I already told you this, Connie, but I'm telling it for the audience. He heard this baby crying, mm-hmm. and he could not figure out where this infant was crying. He went and searched the whole forest, couldn't find anything. And I played a clip for the for him over the phone. He goes, "That's pretty close to what I heard." Uh, tell me about this clip. How did it come about? Awesome. I don't know. I felt really, at this point, I had heard enough and I was really almost becoming paralyzed. I I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if it was dangerous. I didn't know what it was. I thought, okay, surely there is some kind of research group that would be interested and would come out here. And my thought was, I want them to get rid of 
them or it or whatever it is. I just want them to get rid of it. The first person I got a hold of was a Native American. And he was a Native American researcher. And he talked to me for over an hour. And he told me that he knew the area well and that he, as a child, had stayed at the Boy Scout camp, which is actually three miles up the river. And he had his first sighting at the Boy Scout camp. And he said he went home and his mom, he didn't really tell his mom, but his mom came to him and, he, and said, well, it was on the paper, in the paper or on the news that some lady next to the Boy Scout camp saw a Sasquatch walking through her field. And I don't know how that conversation ended, but he did tell me that he did see one. He saw one as a child. And he was Cherokee and they have a different belief. And he said, they, we believe that they are spirit and they are animal and they can shapeshift. And he said, what I do is try and just help people not be so afraid of them. He said, what I would do is I would come and we would just sit around the, the fire and just talk. And I said, well, would you walk back to the furthest part? And he says, no, that's their territory. He said, we would sit there and I guarantee you they would come up and you would see them. And he said, I think that I could even train you to see the orbs with your eyes. So he talked some more and I didn't want to call him up, have him make a three hour trip from where he was because honestly, I am not of the type, I couldn't take it mentally. I don't really have a need to see them. I don't want to see them. It's hard enough for me to hear them and see pictures of them. So I don't think that I would even survive if one actually stepped out. So it's just too far out of my reality box. I guess, yeah, and I, I don't want to go there. I do not know why. It does not feel comfortable. It does not feel safe, and it doesn't feel normal. If, it, if I had a different feeling from it, like comfort or peace or tranquility, yes, but I only feel fear. And the actions that they were taking only felt malicious to me. I mean, if they're trying to get my attention in there, halfway intelligent. I mean, don't come pound on my house or act like you're tearing my new cabin down and push trees down and yell and scream. And that didn't seem right to me. So I went on to the second group. I sat for a while. I thought, you know what? I just have to ignore this. I have to put this down. I have to stop listening, stop recording. This is driving me nuts. But then uh, okay, I'm going to contact somebody else. So I got a hold of another group, which was pure flesh and blood. You were absolutely, you could not be a member of that group if you mentioned what they call woo or anything paranormal. So I talked to the person and he seemed nice and he said, yeah, we'd be interested in investigating and he said he had night vision, and that's all I was interested. What I really wanted is somebody that did have night vision that could maybe look down there on that slope and tell me, yes, there are eight things sitting down there. Just validate for me what is there. Can you see it? Is it an animal? Are we in danger? That kind of thing. And eventually, another guy contacted me that was his partner, and he asked if he could come out on a Saturday evening, I guess. And, and I said, sure, you can stay in that new cabin. You can spend the night, whatever you need to do. But I said, I, please don't knock or yell or scream or do anything you see on TV. I know you play guitar, so I would like to see you just play guitar, play music, and just sit and listen. And I think you'll get a better response that way. And I won't feel like maybe you're provoking them and then we get an aftermath or they become <laughs> right. dangerous to us. Don't piss them off because I have to so, live here. Yes, I have to live there. And I don't, first off, I don't know exactly what I'm dealing with. And I, 
I don't want to make it worse than it is. So they did come, but they said, well, we don't have the flare camera and we didn't bring a camera. And I lent them my parabolic dish and they brought their cell phones. So we did stay there for a while. I guess they walked around. I stayed across the street. We walked around the dark. They were shining flashlights down into the valleys looking. Um, I told them I did place recorders. I placed a recorder across the street in the garage window at the guest house. I placed one in a pile of wood right behind that cabin. And then I placed one in the front yard under a pile of wood. And I told them that the recorders were there because I wanted to see if there's any kind of reaction at all. And they did their thing for a while. And I got a recording, his singing, and he was playing guitar and he played a couple of things. And then you know, they went inside and they would listen with the parabolic dish. And I found out later that I guess they decided to go ahead and throw rocks. What he said, well, we threw rocks down into the quote unquote bowl which I guess was down in a valley where they thought they were. And he said, I got two whoops. So I wasn't really happy and I questioned him about it and then he kind of denied it. And um, I decided that probably wasn't going to work out. But the end result of that is when I reviewed the recorder that was in the wood pile, there was a juvenile type voice that had mocked him singing and you do not have that clip and I could give it to you, but it amazes me. I mean, number one, what are they? Number two, is that a young one? And number three, they sing, they like music. That's like culture to me. I mean, what is really, I don't understand it. I'm not comprehending. It's not adding up. So, Um, I had that recording. I have some other recordings. He said he didn't, he was hearing some things. And then finally I got a call at 1130 and he said, my friend is spooked and we're going to go. He thinks he heard running in the forest. I said, okay, um, just lock everything up and I'll let you know if I hear anything. Um, I reviewed the audio that was in the garage window the next day, and I have never heard anything like it, had not recorded anything like it before. It was that baby, that baby cry, plus it was like it was hitting. It, was, it actually sounded like a temper tantrum for about 30 minutes straight. There was moaning. There was the baby cry and hitting and it sounded exactly like that garage window has tilt out windows so they kind of tilted out it it sounded like it was hitting the glass it sounded like glass something pinging off the glass for 30 minutes straight and then i think it stopped the next day i put a recorder in that window every night because i was getting something every night the next night there was not the knocking the banging the big temper tantrum but there was the crying it wasn't as often it was like sporadic but it sounded just about the same it went on for close to a week before it completely stopped to me it sounded like nothing else but like a a toddler that was throwing a temper tantrum the way it was. And then there was some times that it sounded almost mechanical and then other times it sounded real. And it's just, I could not comprehend what it was, what the noise was, why it was being made, why it, why it was there. Cause number one, that sounds like a young something. If it was a human child, it was January. It was very cold it was dark and that started at midnight. So that means that something bits the street in the cold, in the dark, in January, crying. So that kind of rules out a human baby as yeah. far as I'm concerned. I, I think at some point you have to realize that it's not human. 
Um, but I think that pretty mm-hmm. much sums up most Bigfoot researchers. Now you know why I have such a disdain for most of them because they show up and do crap like this. You know, they're, they're the experts, mm-hmm. they're the researchers, they're the investigators. And they show up and they end up pissing these things off. Then they're going to get in their car and leave. And guess who gets to deal with it once they get up and leave? And I've heard this time and time and time again. And it just burns me. You know, don't, you know, just don't. Um, it just burns me when they do that. I, I don't know why it bothers me so much. Um, but did it eventually stop the baby crying, that noise? Af- yes. After I had recorded for a while, I thought, okay, that was January. I'd actually started the recording at the very end of September, like around the 24th. So I had recorded all of October, all of November. And in those eight weeks, I had never heard or recorded, but of course I did not have the ability to go through hours and hours and hours. So it might be on there, but I never heard it before. And it seemed very odd to me. I put that recorder in there for that reason. I wanted to see if there was any kind of retribution, any kind of reaction, what was going to be recorded at the guest house for what was happening across the street. Because honestly, I didn't really trust that they were going to listen to me and not try and provoke because I think they think that's the only I'm going to see one. I'm going to get a picture if I provoke it and it charges any kind of thing. And they didn't have the patience just to sit in the dark and just listen and look and wait. So um, that's the reaction that happened. I mean, absolutely mind blowing. What in the heck is mine? It seemed to me, not like it didn't seem like an angry retribution kind of thing. It seemed like there were several things very unhappy that somebody with a guitar left and they were enjoying seeing a guitar being played and seeing and hearing someone sing. That's what it felt like. So, yeah, I hear you. I thought, okay, what, (laughs) what in the heck is going on? I mean, are, do these things have language? Do they have culture? What are they? So um, after that, I gave up. I thought, I can't ever bring somebody over there. And I naively thought when this first started that, man, this is a perfect opportunity for somebody to come in here and record because these things are around here all the time. I have not had a, I was praying that I would get nothing on the recorder. I wanted to hear silence. I didn't want to hear bangs. I didn't want to hear voices. I don't want to hear anything, but they're there all the time. And I didn't understand why. I thought, okay, if they're there, why can't somebody come here and research it, get some audio, get some pictures. I mean, somebody with equipment that wants to do it, but, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> but it, I couldn't get anybody to be really legit and honest. And Yeah, I would love to uh, come and check it out. I want to play two more clips here. This one is Slapping New Cabin. And then um, I'm kind of curious about this mocking calling your dog. But let me play this one. This is Slapping New Cabin. Yeah, and that sounds like it's really, really hitting the cabin. Um, this one is mocking me calling Bella, and I'll have you explain it afterwards. Yeah, and that one's creepy too. You know, hearing that, it reminds me, Connie, and you and I have talked about it off the air, but it reminds me of uh, the Browns property. Remember I was telling you about how Mm -hmm. these things would call out Sarah, Sarah, and I was telling you, I'll tell the audience real quick, I was sitting inside the living room, and I was talking to Sarah Brown. If you guys have listened to the show for a long time, you guys know what I'm talking about. It's a property here in Washington State, and 
Sarah would tell me they're calling her name. And I remember thinking, well, how do they know your name? And it hit me when I was there talking to Sarah in her living room. She's showing, you know, she's playing different audio for me. Pretty soon her husband comes home, walks around the side of the house and starts calling her name out in the forest, Sarah, Sarah. And um, the recordings that she had was very similar to almost like they were mimicking her husband calling her name. Um, how often did this happen where they were kind of mocking you calling your dog? That was so far. I haven't, you know, reviewed a lot, but that was one of besides the time when we only had that as a vacation house for like a couple of years. And I, I had the incident where I was in the front yard. It was the middle of the day and I called Buster and immediately something in the forest almost perfectly said Buster. And I honestly, there was a repeater tower there. And for some reason in my mind, I thought that they had the ability to hear what I was speaking and they could pull a prank on me and broadcast over some speaker and say, Buster, this is how I was thinking at the time. Um, I know now that that's just a, you know, a repeater tower. It's just a communication tower. And that's no speakers or the ability to broadcast or hear anything like that. Um, that was the only time, um, my husband did mention he would work over there on that 29 acres and he'd come in and he said, I think that hack was calling me from down below. I thought, he said, but I just ignored him. Uh, "Mm, that's strange. I don't think he's a disabled veteran. I don't think he was, that's very steep slope and quite a ways away. And I don't, didn't make sense that he was hearing his name being called and my daughter, was over there in that cabin during the day and I went over there to check on her and she said, somebody's out there calling for Glenn. I think Glenn, I said, nobody's out there, but I do call for him. So I know if they're mocking it's because I do call him loudly at times yelling for him to come in off the property or whatever, but he never says my name. Nobody ever yells my name and I've never heard my name being spoken back. It's disturbing because you do hear a lot of accounts where, especially when people have these things on their property to where they're calling their name or it's calling, you know, even the siege of, um, of uh, Hanabi that I had on uh, the two brothers, the two brothers that were out there and, and they came under siege of these things. Um, They would talk about their names being called and dogs, you know, uh, their dog being called and one of the brothers said it. The mimic was so good, he thought his brother had taken the day off off the work off work, and was out in the woods calling his name. And so it makes you really. I mean, that's creepy. That's really creepy. Well, that situation was at that time. I had heard and seen a lot, and now I was terrified. And I was chicken, and she wanted to go out, but she's ornery, so she goes all the way something piqued her interest over there at that guest house. She went all the way to the end of the fence and I was trying frantically to get her in because she was just standing there barking. So I'm standing on a second story deck yelling across the yard towards that other property, Bella. And I say at one time, that's the first thing. And then there's this bark and then that sing song Bella that's real high And then there's some other something. And then it's singing this sing song gibberish thing. And I hear another something that sounds very weird and somebody would have to listen to it more closely, but it says Bella talking to you. It sounds mechanical like a robot or something that doesn't know how to speak English. And it goes on. And this thing, it was picked up on a recorder inside that detached garage and that recorder was on the facing the forest so i don't know you'd have to like research how far noise can be picked up on these recorders but that blew my mind and i ended up having to go out in the dark and get her you know i did not want to get off the deck and go across the yard towards those things which I figured were over there just to get her because she was standing there barking at him, I guess. 
that was shocking and very odd. And why did they sing? <laughs> why did they do that? That makes no sense to me. Well, uh, and you unbelievable. Know- well, originally it sounds unbelievable, I guess, to anyone who may be first be listening to the show. But I've had other witnesses say that. Um, I had the guys from Monster Quest, Doug Hycheck. He said that. He said this thing sounded like it was singing, uh, for lack of a better term. Singing? Yeah, he said it was a real oh weird. Um, and he's in the middle of nowhere. You've probably seen it. It's on Monster Quest where the cabin was attacked and Jeff Meldrum and they're all um, out there. Snell Grove Lake. The Snell Grove Lake, yeah. The Snell Grove? Yes, yeah. the Snell Grove. If you go back and listen to that show I did with him, he describes that. He said across the lake, you would hear this weird, almost opera-like scene. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So I just kind of put it in the back of my head. I had a lady on mm-hmm. from Canada who was going through, uh, it was Petra. She was going through a divorce, and she was going through a really, really tough time in her life. And she describes that. She said it sounds like they were singing this weird sing song that they would do early in the morning. And it sounded almost like someone singing across the lake. And she would hear it all the time. And so when you say that, it's not as crazy as you might think. I've heard other witnesses say that. And people who have these things on their on their property, um, it's like I was telling you the other night, Connie, I can almost take what you say word for word and plug it into every person I've talk to off the phone, there's some portion of what you're saying they've experienced of these things being on their property. And it's very strange, very odd, especially the way they're able to mimic. That, yeah, that makes me actually, I had no idea that other people heard singing. I haven't really researched it. I didn't know it was happening, but that actually makes me feel a little bit better that I'm not, this is not um, really, really bizarre. Like, it has been heard before. It's just weird, weird to me. It is weird. Um, it's very so, bizarre. Uh, but it's not out okay. of the realm of, it's not as crazy as you might think. I've heard a lot of people talk about this. I want to get into, I know we're running a little short on time. But God, i got to have you back. I know you have so much audio, and I have so much audio I want to play. Um, I want to ask you, though, about the or So, before we get into the orbs, you had noticed kind of you kind of figured out where they're coming up from, um, and I'll mm-hmm. post some of the pictures that you sent me. There's some good ones in there, um, and the audio that you got, I'll I'll put it up on SasquatchChronicles.com. That way, people can go on and listen to it without having to try and figure out where it's at in the show. I wanted to ask mm-hmm. you about these orbs. Tell me about when what what kind of walked me into it. When did you start noticing these strange lights? What were you seeing, and what did you experience with them? The I never saw one with my eyes. They were right off the bat. We started with the game cameras clear at the furthest part of the acreage for some reason. If we were going to catch vagrants, I don't know if they were going to be back there, but what was totally bizarre is – Number one, like I said, the recording, the first recording was something, you know, pulling on a bungee cord and we couldn't figure out what was going on with that. But most of the cameras always had some kind of anomaly in there. And I know what a bug looks like and I know what an orb looks like. And the orbs that were out there, they weren't really that big in size, not compared to what I was getting at the guest house. But they were there, and most of the time, and they seemed to be glowing. But there's other types of pictures. Like I said, they it wasn't you really couldn't call it a mist. It didn't look misty. It looked like blurry, but something was too close or was moving. Um, there was a lot of that in there, um, right off the bat, and it just seemed like. Every time we put them out over there, there was some pictures. And at times we tried using just the motion and letting something trigger it. And then sometimes we were trying when it triggered to take a little mini movie. One thing that was kind of odd and a little unnerving is on one of those little mini movies, it was actually kind of close to that little cabin and it was right in front of a tree stand. Something was moving 
but you could not see it. And the only way you could tell it was moving is because it was, the background was distorted as it moved. And it just moved from, um, I don't know, it would be south of the tree stand up to the tree stand. And then it was just a little short movie and it stopped. My husband was kind of looking over my shoulder. I said, did you see that? And he, he admitted he saw it. And honestly, I'd have to go digging for that thing. But, you know, something is not there. You cannot see it. It's not showing up. But you can tell that it's moving because the leaves that are behind it look distorted. And you can actually see motion by how it's distorting. And it actually didn't look like something tall or manlike. To me, it looked like in the shape of a deer or something on four legs or something that size. It didn't look gigantic, but it, and you're it just, was odd. And you're describing – this is daytime. You're describing um, – and I know this because you and I have talked, but you're actually describing um, what, what I guess what the Bigfoot world would call cloaking, um, that weird, almost like predator type. I know what you mean because I've I've seen I think it was Barb Shoop that film one, um, and I'll send it to you, Connie, if you want to look at it. But almost like mm-hmm. it's pollution or like the Predator, I guess the best way to describe it. Um, is that what you're talking about? Kind of that see through. Um, yeah, because this was at night. It was a nighttime picture. It was dark, and it was in the illumination of however far that light goes out. But definitely it was, I could tell it was moving because of, it was distorted. The, the object was distorting what you were seeing through, like the leaves behind it were kind of blurred and distorted. And as it right. moved, they'd come back in focus. And as it kept moving, what was behind it came back in focus. But it was blurring stuff as it went. I don't know if it was blurry. It probably was because... It stayed blurry as it moved on, but and everything else came in focus as it left that area. That's something that, honestly, I thought, okay, is there ghosts out here? It just appeared ghost-like to me. Yeah. It was invisible except for that. And, uh, and that was and, moving. And I would agree with you. I, I mean, that was my first impression when I saw it, you know, and, and I don't know, Barb, I've, I think I've talked to her like one time. Um, and I know she's not some mastermind behind technology, but what was she filmed? I, I don't have an answer for it. I mean, it's odd. It's very odd. And and hers was daytime and it's exactly how you describe it. And And I would think if I wasn't into Bigfoot and if I knew nothing about this, I think I would think ghost too. I, I think I'd be with you on that, Connie, as far as what you th- yeah. thought you saw. Um, the orbs, though, uh, the balls of light. Now, you're not seeing those with your own eyes. Is that what you're saying? You're, you're hmm. seeing them through the camera? No. Nope. Well, part of the reason is I wouldn't go I wouldn't go over there at all. I never, ever spend the night over in that forest. I never – I couldn't be. It was too scared scary for me so I wasn't looking for them I wasn't out at night but they were different in the forest they were smaller but what I was also capturing from that slope where I got some of the pictures where those eye the eye shine possibly is is I would capture stick straight beams of light that look like laser beams. Some of them were very faint unless you kind of brought the exposure up where you could see them a little bit better, but stick straight. And they'd go on for a very long time up the slope. And I always wondered what is going on. They seem to be coming, originating from the forest. And I gave you a picture of one that's, I don't know if you've seen it, but it looks like it's coming up from the forest and it ends up at, like on the second story of the guest house, there is a little half moon window and that's where it stops. Like it's almost looking in that window, but it's very um, pronounced. So you can get an idea of what I was seeing, but it, I wasn't capturing it real well, but I could see it faintly. There was just 
really long, straight, laser beam type thing shooting out of the forest up the slope for some reason. The other one, I don't know if it's a light, I call it a light beam, or if it's energy, I have no idea what that is. But it's when I accidentally came across, especially the one that's up on the roof. It seems very large. It's a big orb, but it seems to have, for the lack of a better word, a body to it. And it's standing, it appears to be standing upright over where my daughter was sleeping in that bedroom. So there was another one that I captured, I think about the same time. It wasn't as brilliant, but it was the same size. It had the same body, but it seemed to be hovering and looking inside the house from the riverside. Um, there's many more of those that you haven't seen or I haven't talked about. There was another tube-like thing that I captured because I had a camera actually sitting down on the concrete porch because I was trying to capture what she saw on the porch. But what I captured was a straight cylinder and it actually had two orbs inside of it. I just captured the bottom part of it. Um, lots and lots of those orbs and with the streaks behind them all around the house, many of them. And I don't know why they were concentrated around there and why I was capturing them there. I had moved the camera further away from the house and actually the camera that captured the one on the roof was on a tree across the street. So when it, the cameras were pulled back and further away, you could get a better view of what was going on. I was capturing more things and more bizarre things. Can you do um, me? Can you do me a favor? Will you send those to me? I would love to see them. Um, all the, the the orb. Yeah, you got the one on the roof. Um, do you want to see? I can send you a bunch of them. Yeah, please do if you would. Um, I would love to see them. Okay. And if it's okay, I'll post them up on SasquatchChronicles.com. But, you know, Ron Moore had talked about that. Okay. You know, the guy that uh, recorded the Sierra sounds? Um, I mm-hmm. had him on the show one time. And I know Ron really well. I love Ron to death. Um, but Ron, mm-hmm. um, he was telling me about these strange beams of light. And he describes them like real short laser bursts coming out of the forest. Like a, a call, um, I don't know the best way to describe it. Kind of like hot dog shaped, I guess. For, for forgive me, but I'm a simple man. Were they but, like um, jelly bean shape? Kind of, yeah. Like a, and that's how he describes them. Not really like a ball, but more like um, a beam. Kind of like how he described it. And he saw those many times when they were up there. I even talked to Carrie, and Carrie saw them uh, when they were up there. And I don't have a good answer for. I mean, I don't have a good answer for Sasquatch either, but I don't have a good answer for these lights. I don't know. Are these things related? Are they, they – it's, it's sure odd when I talk to people who have Sasquatch on their property. They'll always go into the lights every time. Every single time they will go into the lights. Eventually, they'll tell me about the lights. Maybe not at first, but eventually they'll tell me about the lights that they see. Um, and it's just odd. It's just weird. It is the only, you can't really, because you don't see them, at least so far, I haven't seen them side by side. And I have found by trial and error that I started going out to that 29 acres and turning the cameras on like at three in the afternoon because I could actually capture something and see faces better or indications of faces from three until the sun kind of uh, disappeared between uh, behind that ridge. And then after like dusk, it was nearly impossible. The camera's not that good and pareidolia kind of takes over and you're just guessing at that point. So um, I got off one. I didn't understand how, 
All I can say is those beams of light are coming from the same areas where I have recorded vocals. And David Ellis said, yes, that is typical suspicious vocals. And they were captured there at that spot where that house is. So I've got the vocal and it's verified. I've got pictures from that slope and those beams are originating from that slope but you don't see them side by side. The beams are seen at night and I'm only being able to see faces and indications of things, you know, during the day. So maybe they can't be seen together, but those three, those three things have been together in the same area. The, the vocals, the beams, um, there are orbs in that area as well. Some of them are at the ends of those beams and what seems like Sasquatch to me. I, I can see them more. I feel like I can see them because I have a 10 second interval and I can scroll through there and put it in motion and kind of watch. They always seem to have a lot in front of their face. And it seems like the only time you see more of them is when it, starting to get dusk and um it almost seems like they know when we leave oh i have a whole nother story that you don't have the audio to go with it i don't know if you have the time but i had been reviewing audio that was in that cabin one day and there was a lot a lot of noise and there was creaking like they were actually trying to push that cabin over because it was on, yeah, it was like a mobile home. It was on wheels at one time. It was strapped down. But there's a lot of loud creaking and the slap that you recorded. I did not recognize what that was. And David Ellis said that's got the signature of a house slap. And it actually made me mad because, man, I paid money for that cabin. And it feels like they're over there just trying to tear it up, push it over, whatever. So um, yeah, it, it sounded really bad. So I sent my husband over there. I said, go over there and check the house and see if it's okay. There was a lot of racket around there. He decided not to drive in. It was dusk. It was getting dark. We had already locked the gate and left, and we were never back in there. I can hear him on the audio unlocking the gate. He goes in. He walks in. He walks around the house. And then he leaves. You can hear the gate close. You can hear the chain. He goes back across the road into the hall. And then there is what I call an alarm bark. It's not a dog bark. It's a real sharp bark. And then you can hear almost a countdown. And David Ellis worked on this. So he went through it all and he enhanced it where we could hear it. And it's like a count. It goes one, two, three three and then whap a really loud tree knock and it sounds like wood is being turned around and he said he hears some gibberish in there and it's like they got surprised because they didn't expect anybody to come back in there it was dusk the gate was locked he walked in and it just sounded like they got caught off guard and they had a bad reaction but I have that, and David worked on it, and it's pretty interesting. Yeah, send it to me. I, I would love you don't to. Have it, though. <laughs> yeah, please send it to me. I, I would love okay, to hear it. And you know the other thing too, Connie. Okay. I mean, you you listen to the show. You know how hard I am on researchers because most of them I don't think they're researching anything unless it's other researchers they want to bash online. But as far as actually this subject goes, I think most of them are a joke. And I'm sure I'll get some heat for that. Mm-hmm. But honestly, I think 99% of them are a joke. Uh, just like the guys that came out, you know, and decided to throw rocks and got scared, got in their car and drove off. I think that pretty much sums up about 99% of the researchers I know. Not all of them, but, uh, you know, a good portion of them. And it is what I love about your encounter. And I know there's so much we need to get to. We haven't even <laughs> hit the tip of the iceberg as far as what's yeah. going on out there. Um, and there's so much more that I want to get to and I want to um, play for the audience. Would you come back, Connie? Would you come back on the show? Absolutely. 
like I said, two, two of the properties are sold and this is kind of like unfolding, but he has made the decision to keep the house that has most of the activity and where I get most of the vocals. So as we speak, he is setting out a recorder and a camera nightly. So I'm just going to see what happened, what happened, if anything happened since we left and there's a new person in the house and just, I have no idea. I haven't, we will see. Well, and, you know, even your falls off to nothing or. Yeah. And I appreciate coming back. And I know even your daughter moved out of that house because it was starting to get too weird for her. It got, I'd love to come mm-hmm. out there and stay a week in, in that place. I wanted to ask you though, there, there's so much more to get to. There's so many weird things. Like I said, we barely touched the surface of it. Um, I want to ask you what, what, and I love this story because you, it, I, I could tell right off the bat you didn't believe in Bigfoot, and I don't think your husband believes in Bigfoot. And you guys went on this property mm-hmm. with, it started out with being, well, that's strange, well, that's strange, well, that's strange, well, that's strange. Let's try and write it off as this or that, you know, as any nor- sane person would do. And then eventually it gets to the point where it's like mm-hmm. you can't write some of the stuff off. Eventually it gets to the point to where you can only tell yourself you're hearing an owl or – Maybe it's a cell phone tower reflecting back, calling your dog's name, or and I think deep down you know. I mean, you're a very smart lady. Deep down, you know it was none of those things. But it, I think, as a normal human reaction is to try and and justify what what you're hearing, or justify what you're recording, or justify what you're seeing. Um, and I love that about you. The fact that. You took the time to go out there, set up audio, set up video, start documenting things. I mean, you're a real researcher, Connie. <laughs> I mean, compared to these other guys, they got <laughs> nothing on you. Uh, you're a real researcher. You know, you're. I, a- I would say a very, very chicken and reluctant researcher, well, mainly because I felt like number one, it was somebody bad on the property that was shouldn't be there. And then I found out I wasn't seeing people. I was seeing things that I couldn't understand. And then I didn't know how dangerous it was. And then I saw advice from a lot of people and I got all across the board from they will not hurt you to, I got a very, very long message from somebody on a forum that said, please listen to me. You are in danger. I've been around this enough to know, and I've researched this enough to know that you are in danger. Do not go in that forest by yourself at all. Don't even go very far in the forest. If you hear that baby cry, don't follow it. Um, They didn't have to tell me that because I am super chicken, wouldn't go out there at night. And um, I still, I would not have any desire to see one at all. And I just feel like it's too far out of my reality. It changes my world too much. I have to stay yeah. in control because I have a family and I don't, I just want to protect them. And it's like, I just want to, uh, I don't know, in one way I want to know, but I know in my heart and soul that no matter how much we research this and take pictures and listen to audio we can't prove it because there's no frame of reference. The only frame of reference, and thank God that you're doing it, is getting people on and getting them to talk about this. That has helped me tremendously because I didn't know that other people had things singing and I didn't know that other people saw beams of light. And that is really helpful because that's the only thing you can compare it to is what did somebody else see on their property? You can't compare it to any reality or an ape or something. You just have to compare it to other people. Yeah. So it, it's actually a tremendous service that you're doing. If you could just keep it up forever, <laughs> it would be great. Cause I think it helps. It's really traumatic. It, yeah. it shouldn't be, but unless you live it, and you go out there and you hear it in real time and you feel threatened by it and it changes your life and you have to, you feel like you have to leave the property. 
And I had somebody ask me, did you tell the people that are buying that property what's going on? I thought, hmm, there's, there's researchers that don't believe what I'm saying. And I felt like I did tell the listing agent that just tell them that there's large predators that they need to be careful out there and just keep an eye out. And thank God it ended up being local people that were Native Americans. So they know the history of the area and they have their own beliefs. And I think they'll be fine. Plus, we'll be their neighbors. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. So I guess we're kind of in it together. Well, you know, I mean, what are you supposed to say to someone who's buying your property? <laughs> we got Sasquatch out here, you know, they'll think you're a nut. <laughs> You know, so what are you, what are you really supposed to say to someone, you know? And, and, you know, I got a, I got a sneaky suspicion because, you know, I've talked a lot off the air. I got a sneaky suspicion you're braver um, and stronger than you think. I don't, I don't quite buy into the coward thing you're talking about or that you're a scaredy cat. You might be scared and I think that's normal. Um, I think for anyone who encounters these things, it's normal to be scared, but um, I just appreciate everything that you've done, you know, setting up, you know, most people don't do this. They don't set up recorders. They don't set up cameras. They fall into the category of, okay, something is on the property. I can't explain it. Um, I think it's this. I don't want to say on the record, I think it's Sasquatch, but off the record, I'll tell you, I think it's Sasquatch, um, even though I didn't believe in it, but I, that's kind of what I think. And and most of the time, it's, it, it ends with, how do I get rid of them? How do I make them go away? Mm-hmm. You know how many times I've heard people say, mm-hmm. how do I just make, I just want these things to go away. I don't, you know, like mm-hmm. you guys be spent time, money, building this beautiful f- vacation home in the middle of nowhere. That's what bugs a lot of these researchers because you're most of the time people in this situation, they're not ter- looking to turn this into a Jane Goodall, let's study the chimps uh, type situation. They just want them to go away. They want this to end. And the weirder and weirder it gets, the more uncomfortable it gets. You know, when something's starting to call your Mm -hmm. dog, it's mimicking you, it's calling your husband's name. That's creepy. I don't care who you are. That is creepy. I wanted to ask you, though, what do you think? What do you think, Sasquatch is, Connie? What's your honest opinion? And there's no wrong answer, of course. Honestly, my feeling from what I've heard, what I've seen, on that property, I feel like it is closer to what the Native Americans have told me they think it is or what they believe it is. It seems more to me from what I've experienced that perhaps it is what they say. It is spirit and it has ability to be an animal, Um, whether it's evil or has a capability of being evil. I don't know, but it has a capability of being malicious in my um, feeling. I don't, all the behavior except the temper tantrum that went on, like they were really sad that the guitar playing stopped, but the rest of it seems just malicious in nature. Why would you torture a person and scare a person that's disabled? And spin and keep her up in the middle of the night, banging and hitting the wall and doing all that stuff. It's just too malicious. And I don't understand why there would be a need to be malicious and mischievous like that. So part of me thinks the Native Americans got it right and the rest of it, I don't know. I really do not know. I think there's a malicious part of them as well. So clueless. Yeah. It's just no, hard to it. hard to wrap your head around. It, it really is. is. Yeah. I would agree with you on that. Let's hope you're wrong. Let's hope it's just a monkey. But I got a feeling that it's not just a monkey. Um, especially when you hear of some of the things that went on on your property. I got to have you back, Connie. There's so many things I want to get into and you know it's I don't want to turn it into a heavy sit here for three hours and I know you could probably sit here for 10 hours and go through everything <laughs> but um I don't know I have a I have a lot I, have I know you do I know you do things that just little weird things I mean there's a lot of little stories that go with 
books and stuff. And I, like I said, I haven't even had a chance to look at a lot, a lot of photos. I actually, at one point, was trying to get better photos. I actually have a really good camera and some really long t- telephoto lens because I just like photography. And I finally could get something to take star pictures and Milky Way pictures. So I actually was trying to shoot from the second story deck at night across down by the guest house and couldn't ever figure out how to get it to work. I got something that was suggestive, but if I were to show it to somebody, I had one guy that that picked it out right away and I see it and it's what I think and how they kind of hide themselves. They kind of put stuff on their face and this, this thing is sitting there and it looks like it has plastered leaves all over his face, but of course the shape of his face is there, even though it's covered with leaves. I don't know. That may not make sense. No, it does. You know, that's kind of what I gathered from that picture. So I don't really show it to anybody because I really probably couldn't convince anybody there was something under those leaves. But he picked it out. And it's it's different though when you uh, you live on a property, you know the area, and you're snapping pictures and going, "Hey, there's something there." Um, it's interesting you say that. I, I, a member of my site, Monte, um, who I'm going to be interviewing, he's in northern Idaho. He told me the same thing. They put grass and and uh, there's one in particular that puts uh, moss all over its face. And I thought, hmm, that's strange. And then when he just said that, it made me think of what he just told me last week of these creatures putting moss. Oh, I have, I have, I have another picture that. I can send you as well. And it's more, this is the one that kind of got me in trouble with the forum that I was on. Cause to me, it's plain as day. It's, it's head is above the grass. It's in the afternoon. You can see it. It looks, it's got something over his head, but it's not on straight. It's got eye holes and it's got a mouth hole on this thing, but it's kind of cocked sideways and it's kind of peeking out the side of it. But I have the other pictures that go with it, and I can see on other days that there's something there, and there must be brush there because they put brush on their head, and they just kind of peek through it and around it and just pile it on their head. But you can see them at times trying to look around it or through it, and sometimes you're lucky and you can get enough visual of the face to say, aha, that's where you are. I can see part of you, but I can't see all of you. So, yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Well, I'll definitely have to have you back, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and and talk about what's going on in your property. And I enjoy talking to you, Connie. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I enjoy talking to you, and thanks for letting me know some of the things I didn't know. And yeah, I'm a serious fan now, and I'm always looking for people that had experiences around my area so i will be looking for those and i'll let you know i'll email you what i find out happened while he was there last week and then i'll try and find some of these other interesting things and send them to you and just let me know yeah please send it to me and thank you again connie for coming on the show i really appreciate you being here tonight you're welcome And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone.